Hi, I'm Rosie Mazeka of the Bonneville Power Administration. For over 70 years, Bonneville has kept the lights on in the Pacific Northwest, marketing electricity from the largest hydropower system in the nation that includes the big federal dams on the Columbia and Snake Rivers. BPA then provides this electricity to the people of the Northwest at low cost through more than 15,000 miles of high voltage transmission lines. Bonneville is also proud of its energy efficiency measures, saving enough electricity over the past 30 years to power four cities the size of Seattle. But what you may not know is that Bonneville also uses the money paid by its electric rate payers to fund and oversee one of the largest fish and wildlife mitigation programs in the world. During the next half hour, you'll get a glimpse of the many BPA-funded projects to protect and restore salmon and steelhead for the citizens of the Pacific Northwest. Let's begin our journey in the Columbia River estuary, where the vast Columbia meets the sea. This first story showcases a BPA-funded project near the mouth of the river at Chinook, Washington, opening up important habitat for young fish. Shovel after shovel. Scoop after scoop. Construction crews near Chinook, Washington slowly turn an historic tidal wetland in the Columbia River estuary into a new home for young salmon and steelhead. This one's coming in low. Hey, watch you out of the way. The crews install an enormous 70 foot long by 12 foot wide concrete culvert, complete with a natural stream bottom beneath Highway 101. Once finished, the culvert will reopen water access underneath the roadway so Columbia River Tidewater can once again help young salmon swim into this 96-acre marsh. The historic tidal wetland was first detailed on the maps of explorers Lewis and Clark, but a railroad in the 1890s and later Highway 101 cut the wetland off from the river. So for the last century, the only water that flowed from the wetland to the Columbia was through this tiny concrete culvert, which had no fish passage at all. I'm very excited about this project because it helps make the estuary more natural for people who now live here and for the fish, birds. Ecology experts from the Columbia River Estuary Study Task Force, or CREST, are in charge of construction. They believe the wetland's shallow waters will provide a place for juvenile salmon to rest eat and grow. One of the things science is saying to us right now is that these wetland habitats are very important for eating patterns so that they get larger, it just basically a snack bar for the, for the juveniles. To complete the project, crews built a 12 foot high by 80 foot long coffer dam to keep the waters of the river out during construction. They also placed root wads and large woody debris inside the wetland and reshaped the opening so tide water can more easily flow in and out of the marsh. Scientists say they now realize habitat such as this is important for young fish to transition from fresh water to salt. Size has an implication for survival when they get to the ocean. So one of these, the goals of this project is to provide them with another food source. The Bonneville Power Administration provided a large chunk of the funding and helped manage the project. BPA fisheries biologist John Bacher says the latest scientific research shows restoring tidal wetlands such as this may be critical to threatened and endangered salmon and steelhead. Yeah, I mean, well, there's tens of thousands that come through the Columbia River and then all the fish in, from uh, the entire basin are coming through here, so it's possible that any one of them, or all of them, could touch this. Yep, there's a salmon. Okay. So we got a salmon. And early results show the project, which was just completed in February, is working. I'm guessing the little ones are the chum fry, and that bigger one may have been a coho. We'll have to look. Already, researchers have found coho, chum, and Chinook salmon using the tidal marsh. Here's a salmon measuring 39 millimeters. Bigger Chinook here. It, it is really exciting to see the project come to fruition and we're seeing a relatively large initial success here. We still can't really um, determine that this project has been effective until we do this some years to come. The coho, this is 
Positive results such as these are proof that cooperation between government agencies and their partners can work. I think it's a matter of, of people working together and salmon are the beneficiaries in this case. Well, scientists estimate that little more than one third of the Columbia River's wetlands that were here when Lewis and Clark explored still exist today. For its part, Bonneville Power promises to improve more tidal marshes in the river's estuary because they could be vital for salmon and steelhead. For Bonneville Power, I'm David Wilson. In their efforts to protect and restore salmon, Bonneville has developed partnerships among the basin's tribes, states, and local communities. This next story highlights how partnerships between entities in the Umatilla River Basin have brought fish back to an area where they had been extinct or just barely hanging on. To native people whose ancestors have lived on the Columbia Plateau for thousands of years, healthy rivers with plentiful salmon and steelhead are essential to life. One of the things I strive for is returning salmon to those places where they historically were. Beautiful fish. And when it comes to the Umatilla River, few people work harder to care for its waters and fish than tribal member and biologist Preston Bronson. So we are radio tagging this fish to assess migration, timing through the lower river system. At the river's three mile dam fish passage facility, Bronson and his team work daily to account for adult returns. Today they are trapping and tagging the river steelhead. Non-tag S2 to the dam. Throughout most of the 20th century, fish in the Umatilla faced extremely low water, high temperatures and poor fish passage systems at irrigation dams. The unfriendly environment made it nearly impossible for fish to reach upriver spawning grounds. Salmon disappeared, steelhead hung on by a thread. Salmon went extinct here. For over 70 years, salmon were not in this river. But today, Umatilla steelhead and salmon have made a comeback. Once again, they're spawning in the upper reaches of the river, continuing their ancient life cycles. Female S1 non-tag to the dam. Bronson says the reintroduction of salmon and the restoration of endangered steelhead could not have occurred if governmental agencies, irrigators and tribes had not partnered to save fish. We're out here to resolve historical conflicts and compromise and get fish back into the river system. The backbone of the success is a water exchange program funded in part by Bonneville Power. In the 1990s, Eastern Oregon farmers agreed to draw water from the Columbia River instead of irrigating from the Umatilla, leaving more water in the Umatilla for fish. Bonneville Power also paid for screen and ladder improvements at Umatilla irrigation dams. Those changes, along with a robust hatchery program and habitat restoration effort, brought fish back. I think one of the best parts about the story of the Umatilla is you started from ground zero. This was a, a system that had no water and no fish, and, and we now have runs again. BPA biologist Timmy Mandish says the Umatilla story of collaboration could be used as a blueprint to restore fish runs in other river basins. It's about bringing um, different entities to the table and working together toward a common solution. 2010 marked the Umatilla's highest fall Chinook return on record. Other runs of Chinook, Coho, and Steelhead now number into the thousands. That's what I take most pride in, is not handling those fish and allow those fish to reach the headwaters on their own volition. Female, But for now, biologists still have to monitor and assist a large percentage of the salmon and steelhead migrating up the Umatilla to assure their survival. But Bronson is dreaming and working toward the day when thousands of fish return to the Umatilla and spawn without the help of people. Just like in the days of his ancestors. Restoring salmon runs to allow people to fish from, from Umatilla River to the Toucanon and the Grand Ron is what we're working for. Biologists believe that restoring degraded habitat on tributaries to the Columbia River is key to restoring salmon and steelhead. Many of these projects would not be possible without the support and involvement of private landowners. A project on Bridge Creek in the John Day Basin is a great example of what can happen when people work together to help fish. 
It's just a small Eastern Oregon Creek, but it could play a big role in the recovery of Northwest salmon and steelhead. This is Bridge Creek, a tributary to the John Day River. And scientists say the little stream contains extremely valuable fish habitat. Really no human influences, uh, gorgeous shading, and a great deal of food source for the fish, as well as additional gravels. But until recently, salmon and steelhead couldn't access the miles of pristine spawning grounds in Bridge Creek's headwaters that they once used. Irrigation diversions and an old culvert block the seasonal migrations of salmon and steelhead. This bridge provides additional passage for you know all native species in the system. You know, we used to have a, a big culvert that was kind of failing, rotting out at the bottom and provided uh, at least a partial barrier. The large rusty culvert once located at the entrance to the John Day Fossil Beds National Monument has been replaced by a bridge, making it much easier for salmon and steelhead to swim upstream. It's all thanks to the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs Indian Reservation and partners such as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Wheeler Soil and Water Conservation District. For the first time in decades, Salmon and steelhead can again swim into the rich spawning and rearing grounds of Upper Bridge Creek. Additional habitat improvements further up the creek have also been good for fish. Last summer, construction crews replaced this old concrete irrigation diversion with this brand new fish ladder. It was the last of several barriers to be removed from the stream, unblocking miles of habitat. It's great for the fish. We're seeing increased steelhead numbers, and now we've seen uh, Chinook within the Bridge Creek watershed. Gabe Williams of the Wheeler Soil and Water Conservation District coordinated the Bridge Creek improvement projects. He's proud of the 88-foot-long fish ladder he designed. For me, it was, it was a big challenge that I accomplished with the help of a lot of others, and, and that means a lot to me. Williams says the complexities of the fish ladder, which was constructed to help fish make it upstream even during low water flows, was difficult to build because of the site's remoteness and topography. It's a great showcase project just because of what it's accomplished. and it came in there and showed that by working with a lot of different landowners and a lot of different agencies, difficult projects can be accomplished. We're making some huge progress here in the John Day, and this is, this is a prime example of passage into pristine habitat. Bonneville Power biologist John Bacher recalls visiting the site before construction began three years ago. He remembers watching fish struggle to swim beyond a six-foot-high concrete dam that was located downstream from the new ladder and has since been removed. And there happened to be some adult steelhead here that day that were trying to leap over and they were bashing their head against the concrete and had no chance of, uh, of making it. Of course, fish habitat improvement projects like Bridge Creek would not be possible without partners like the Bonneville Power Administration, which provided a large portion of the project's funding. Plus, it's imperative to have the cooperation of local landowners, such as Craig Woodward, who owns this section of Bridge Creek. I, I've never denied one of these type projects. We've had several of them on our property. If it benefits the fish, that's good as far as I'm concerned. It will take years to learn the exact impact of the new bridge and ladder on Bridge Creek's wild fish populations, but scientists suspect the improvements will greatly increase salmon and steelhead numbers. And Warm Springs Travel Fisheries biologist Scott Turo says, with just a little more work, Bridge Creek's fish habitat can be made even better. If we can get more pools, more roughness, more hiding places, more places them to evade predation, things like that, then we can further increase that production in build on the benefits of increased fish pageants and things like that. Landowner cooperation is also vital to projects that attempt to keep fish out of irrigation ditches. Without fish screens and landowner involvement, it's estimated that tens of thousands of fish would die each year. In Eastern Oregon, Bonneville has been funding the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's Fish Screen Shop, where state workers build, install, and maintain screens to keep fish out of irrigation diversions. What I do is I'm going to 
I'm gonna break, break this trash and I'll put it in a pile over there. He's a hard working maintenance man. Every time you come to a screen, you're more than just cleaning. You look around for some kind of uh, things that could go wrong. But you might also call Jim Smith a kind of hero. It's uh, quite a chore. Smith works to save lives, the lives of fish. We had uh, 16, 18 inch big cutthroats come in here. We get all the salmon, steelhead, white fish. Every week, Smith travels throughout the John Day River Basin, cleaning the hundreds of screens used to stop salmon and steelhead from swimming into irrigation canals and dying. I enjoy doing what I do, saving the fish, the salmon, the steelhead. Many of the 325 irrigation screens on the John Day look similar to this one. Rotated by water wheels to help remove debris, the devices are placed at canal entrances to keep fish out. Since 1993, workers at the state-run fish screen shop in John Day, Oregon, have designed and built hundreds of irrigation diversion screens. My heart's always been in whatever I'm doing, and, if, and right now it's with Fish and Wildlife and it's with Fish Screening and Passage. John Day Fish Screening and Passage Program Manager Kelly Stokes believes the screens he manufactures make a huge difference. And we do a presence absence each year and basically we trap fish that would come up into the irrigation ditch and then go on down if there wasn't a screen and we, and we count them at that point. And it's hundreds of thousands each year that would perish. Okay. And it's likely those fish would die and the screen program fail without the help of ranchers like Ken Holliday. He's happy to allow screens on his land as long as water diversions still meet his agricultural needs. That there has to be something in this for everybody. I mean, the landowner, whenever you design these projects, you have to come out here and it has to be something that benefits everybody, mutual. It's important because it's the first mechanism besides habitat restoration to truly protect fish. Jamie Swan of Bonneville Power says the Fish Screen program is a great example of people working together to save fish. That collaboration amongst all those entities out here that um, allows all the work that we're doing out in the John Day to be as successful as it is. With its federal and state partners, the Bonneville Power Administration provides a generous portion of the funding for the Fish Screen program, helping to make it a success. We could put as much money as we want to in this basin to plant trees, but really if fish are going down the ditch, then we've lost the biggest benefit. And so that's why the work is so important. An important effort aiding the recovery of Northwest wild salmon and steelhead. Turns out, not only does Bonneville's Fish and Wildlife Program help protect fish, but there's an added benefit of supporting jobs in local communities. From the hundreds of fish habitat improvement projects across the Northwest, here at 23 and 3 quarters, to this metal fabrication shop in Eastern Oregon. Every year, millions of dollars are spent on the ground improving streams, rivers, and wetlands. And while the program, funded largely by Bonneville Power, delivers real benefits for fish and wildlife, those dollars also help the region in another way. The projects create jobs. Where would you be without these without these habitat restoration projects? Where would your company be? I guess we would have half the equipment, half the employees, and, and half the work. The owner of Thompson Brothers Excavation in Vancouver says since the economic slowdown, approximately half of his company's work is fish habitat restoration. It seems like every job's got some kind of, you know, wetland type work, mitigation. According to recent statistics from the University of Oregon, for every $1 million spent on forest and watershed restoration, on average, 17 jobs are created. In 2010, Bonneville Power spent approximately $70 million on habitat restoration in four northwestern states, supporting an estimated 1,200 jobs. For example, this metal fabrication shop in John Day employs 25 people. 
Funded in part by BPA, every year the workers construct dozens of fish screens used to stop salmon and steelhead from getting trapped in irrigation ditches. There's a lot of unemployment, and so the kind of restoration work that we're engaged in really does aid the local economy. A Northwest Conservation Group called the Columbia Land Trust hires for habitat restoration work, and a portion of its projects are also funded through the BPA. Not only the actual construction, but also planting trees, planting vegetation, removing invasive species. And the improvements to fish habitat often occur on tribal lands, where the projects support jobs in those communities as well. That has a great impact. When the fish come back, it provides employment to people who are providing the meals, the uh, fishing supplies. You know, they buy gas in the local communities, they, they shop for their equipment supplies in the local communities, so there is a trickle-down effect. You know, we had just minimal guys laid off on unemployment this winter. We, we worked quite a bit through the winter. And their families, their kids are, are getting the paychecks, and, um, you know, it's really helped our employees. Over the past several decades, Bonneville and its federal, state, tribal, and local partners have made great strides towards protecting and restoring Northwest salmon and steelhead. And the efforts are paying off with some of the highest returns of salmon since the 1930s. Without a doubt, there's more work to be done. And Bonneville hopes to remain at the forefront of these efforts, balancing the needs of the river, the people it serves, and the fish and the wildlife the agency is committed to protect. You can learn more about Bonneville Power at bpa.gov and once there, follow the links to our Facebook, Twitter and YouTube accounts.